Just how, how is the wind blowing? What, what is the spirit? How do you go with this one? Sometimes in camp meeting, you go with, a, with kind of a, an uplift and a send-off and send them home that way. That's appropriate occasionally. <clears throat> there are other times when, when an appeal for the lost is, is appropriate, and you try to find the mind of the Lord. I confess to you that while praying over this particular service, there was one reoccurring thought that stayed in my mind. And every time I thought of something else, this thought came back to me. I thought, surely there'll be a lovely crowd, as indeed there is, probably nearly a thousand people here. And I thought, just suppose, just suppose the situation was different. Just suppose I wasn't here, another preacher was. And suppose it was my unsaved child that slipped into the service. What would I want him to preach? What would I want him to do? What would I want him to say? And I, that kept reoccurring in my mind. And I said, oh God, will you help me somehow? I make no apology for the fact that once again tonight, I, by God's help, intend to preach to you a very simple gospel message. And I call to everyone here who knows the worth of prayer, will you pray somehow? for that soul that is here. I think it would be a spiritual tragedy if they should leave the campgrounds here at Anderson without their spiritual need having been met. Somehow I think you and I both know that we're going to stand before an almighty God someday and give an account. I'll give an account of every message I've ever preached, I'm sure. And you'll give an account of every message you have heard, every bit of truth. This service is no different. and We approach it with that kind of solemnity and that kind of seriousness. I would read to you a, an abbreviated passage out of the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 7. <clears throat> this verse was quoted in the afternoon message, but my heart is drawn to it. Matthew, chapter 7. Verses 13 and 14. You know them so very well, you may turn to them or you may trust me, but they go like this. Enter ye in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life and few there be that find it. Let us pray. Father in heaven, I pray this night that you would speak very keenly to the soul who is the farthest from heaven and the closest to hell. I pray that you would touch my heart and my lips with anointing that only God can give. I know that I do not have the human ingenuity and the human strength and the human wit and the human fluency with which to preach this message unless the Holy Ghost would come and help me. I pray tonight that you would answer some mother's prayers for the salvation of her child. I pray tonight that you would answer some wife's prayers for the salvation of her husband, some husband's prayers for the salvation of his wife, some child's prayer for the salvation of the daddy or the mommy. Oh God, save a soul this night. For Lord, and thou dost come and un into eternity but a few moments, nothing else in all the world will matter. And help us, Lord, to do tonight what we'll wish we had done when we stand before thee. In Jesus' name, amen. The first gate ever made in this world was made of flaming swords. The first gatekeeper was an angel. And that gate was built and designed to keep people out rather than to keep them in. You can read the account of that first gate there at the Garden of Eden in the book of Genesis, chapter 3. But since that time, throughout the Bible, you can read repeatedly of gates. Almost every book in the Bible somewhere talks about a gate. All the way over to the very last chapter of the last book, 
the book of the Revelation. And there you'll read such words as, Blessed are they that keep his commandments, that they might have a right to the tree of life, and may enter in through the gates into the city. But not all gates that are spoken of in the Bible are good gates. Our Lord stood with his disciples on one occasion and talked about the church he was going to build. And he said to them concerning that church that the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I've seen some beautiful gates in this world. I've seen the gates at Buckingham Palace, and they're quite striking in their beauty. I've seen some historically interesting gates. I've seen the Conqueror's Gate or Napoleon's Gate in Paris and its historical value I found quite interesting. I've seen some gates that had interesting architecture. The gate of the Cathedral of St. Sophia in Kiev, Ukraine is a very interesting gate. I've seen some interesting gates. But I read to you tonight from the Word of God about two gates. And these gates are extremely, extremely important. These gates tonight are more important to you than the very gates of heaven because tonight you do not stand at heaven's gate. These gates are more important to you than are the gates of hell because tonight, thank God, you do not stand at that portal. These gates are important because you do stand here. You stand before these gates. And there's two of them addressed in, this, in these two verses. He said, enter ye in at the straight gate. Now, if one should perchance overlook the spelling of the word straight, you would miss the entire premise of this message. It is not spelled with a G. It is not spelled S-T-R-A-I-G-H-T. If it were, it would meant that it had no curves and no turns and no bends. But it's spelled S-T-R-A-I-T, which simply means it is a discipline gate. This word is the same word that we use in the term of a straight jacket. I've met some folk who thought that's what religion was all about, just a straight jacket. But it isn't so. But there is this similarity in the gate that we enter is also a restrictive and a disciplined gate. If someone has come tonight wanting to hear the preacher tell everybody that it's simple believism and all you have to do is just kind of get hyped up about it and make a decision that you want to follow Christ and, and take off on your way, you are going to be sadly mistaken. I believe we're misleading, misleading thousands of souls across America, telling them that it's just kind of a snap of the finger and it's just a little something you're going to do tonight and you're all going to be set for heaven. I've come to tell you that if you're going to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, you must enter in through a gate of discipline. You're entering in upon a life that has some restrictions. You're entering into a, into a walk that has some boundaries to it. He said, enter ye in at the straight gate. We will call it the gate of discipline. Would you notice with me please some things that one might expect to encounter when you enter in through this straight or disciplined gate? First of all, if you're going to enter in here, it, must, it is going to be a disciplined will. It is going to take your very will. You must will to be a child of God. Tonight, if the service would so go, that there would be an invitation. And I do intend to give you an invitation to pray in a little while. But it might be that someone who loves you, who has prayed for you, and is burdened for you, might make their way to your side. And it's possible I've seen it happen before. Maybe they would get you by the arm or put an arm around your shoulder and they might weep and cry and tell you that you really need to come to this altar and that you really need to get saved. In a few moments, maybe another well-intending friend would come along and now you have one on either side. And now they're both telling you how important it is that you pray tonight and that you get right with God. And finally you look and a lot of folk are looking your way and praying and crying. 
and all of a sudden you decide, well, I'd better do something about this. And so you step out and you come and they finally leave you alone and you pray a little prayer and go home and absolutely nothing, absolutely nothing has changed in your heart because your will was not in it. I'm not against inviting someone to the altar to pray, but I want to tell you one thing. It will not do you a snap's worth of good unless your will has come to the place where you will to enter into this gate and you choose of your own will to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. You can pray at every altar in this county. You can travel to every camp meeting throughout the summer and pray at every altar and come at every evangelist appeal. But if your will is not in it, you have done nothing but waste your time and the energy and the efforts of those who gather to pray with you. It is a disciplined will if you're going to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Sometimes uh, I, I, I believe that we have kind of have distorted this business of the will. Sometimes it seems that we we think that it's kind of left up to us to get it all together for everybody else. I'm not a Westerner, but if I were, and if I were a rancher, as I understand it, if I had a thousand head of cattle, and I turned those thousand head of cattle loose on the open prairie to graze, I'd hire some cowboys and I'd go out and I'd lasso them and I'd throw them down and out of the hot fire I would pull a brand and I'd put my big circle K on every flank. I would hold it down until the hair had burned off, until the hide had singed. I'd make sure my brand was upon them. Because next fall when I wanted to take them to market, I'd have to go back and pick out the ones that had my brand on it and take them to market. But if I had a thousand head of sheep grazing in the same open prairie, I would not brand one of them because their brand is obedience. And the Lord God did not call us his cattle, but he said, my sheep know my voice, and a stranger they will not follow. Therefore, it is absolutely necessary that your will be settled upon serving God because you're going to follow him not by a brand and not by a label and not by some outward markings necessarily, but you're going to follow him first and foremost because your heart and your will is set upon following the good shepherd. Anything else smells like hypocrisy to me. It has to be the fact that your will is disciplined, that you have entered into the gate of discipline and have found the disciplined will. Not only is it a disciplined will if you should enter this gate, it is also a disciplined walk. A disciplined walk. Do not believe. Hear me, my friends. Teenagers, young people in this assemblage tonight, please hear me. Do not believe for one minute The person who tells you it doesn't matter how you live. It doesn't matter what you do. Just as long as you kind of decide in your heart you want to go to heaven. Don't you believe them for a minute. They are the enemy of your soul. And they will cause you to lose your soul. Because it does matter how you live. And it does matter how you walk. And it does matter how you view things. And how you conduct yourself according to the word of God. Because you're entering into the discipline gate. You're living a disciplined life and it's a disciplined walk. Let me tell you how disciplined this walk is. This walk is so disciplined that if you're going to enter this gate that you are not allowed to hate one another. I read in the Bible, he that hateth his brother is a murderer. He is saying it's a disciplined walk and you're not allowed to hate them. The mother-in-law, the father-in-law, whoever it is, you're not allowed to hate them. Amen. The former pastor, the succeeding pastor, you're not allowed to hate them. The one who voted you out, you're not allowed to hate them. The one who stole your boyfriend or your girlfriend, you're not allowed to hate them because you've entered into a disciplined walk. Hallelujah. This walk is so disciplined that you're not allowed to lie because the Bible says all liars shall have their part in the lake of fire. You're not allowed to lie. Let every man speak truth with his neighbor. It's a disciplined walk. 
It is not a case where the Lord kind of turns his head and winks a little bit if you have to tell a little white lie to get out of a tight spot. It is not so. You live by truth in this disciplined walk. It is such a disciplined walk that you're not allowed to lust. For the Bible says, again, he that looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. It's a disciplined walk, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, that God would help us and deliver us from misleading you into believing that it's just a little kissy face kind of religion and that all you have to do is smile right and feel good and pat your foot on the right songs and raise your hand at the right place and everything is fine. No, sir, I'm telling you it's a disciplined walk if you're going to follow the Lord Jesus Christ and if you're going to come to this altar and pray, make up your mind before you come that when you rise from this altar, you're going to walk in newness of life, a new creature in Christ Jesus. All things are going to pass away and behold all things are going to be new it's a disciplined walk it's such a disciplined walk that laziness is forbidden he that will not provide for his own is worse than an infidel I'm telling you it's a disciplined walk it's such a disciplined walk that I'm not allowed to gossip about you and you about each other it's a forbidden thing it's such a disciplined walk that I'm not allowed to harbor unforgiveness in my heart because it's a disciplined walk. It isn't a walk that we can just nurture all of these ill wills and these feelings that ought not to be there. We have entered into the straight gate. We have entered into a new economy of living. We have entered into a life uh, where we rule these things out uh, and we walk by different precepts uh, and we live by a different principle. We live by the Word of God and by the grace of God and it's a disciplined walk. Young people, let me tell you right now, if you're going to live with the Lord Jesus Christ and follow him, you're not going to have a badge on this side, the side that says, I love the grateful dead, and one over here that says, I love Jesus. They just don't go together. Because you've entered into a disciplined life, and your walk is different. You don't have one over here that says, I love country western, and one over here says, I love Jesus. They just don't go together. Not one over here that says, I love rock music, and one that says, I love Jesus. They don't go together. It's a disciplined walk. You're not going to have one vacation wardrobe that, that reflects one level of modesty and another wardrobe that reflects a different level of modesty when you go home. I'm telling you, it's a disciplined walk. And if we may as well come to the fact that we're living for the Lord Jesus Christ. We're not in this thing for a trivial matter. It is not a joke with us. It is not a game with us. We have entered into the gate of discipline. Hallelujah. Unforgiveness is not allowed. Therefore, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Colossians 1 and 10, that ye might walk worthy of the Lord. Not only is this gate of discipline, not only is it a disciplined will and a disciplined walk, but it's also a disciplined work. God does not allow you to enter this gate to loiter. You enter this gate to labor. Amen. We have too many who have gotten in and you've just been loitering ever since, doing absolutely nothing for Jesus Christ. You haven't as much as held a gospel track in your hand in the last year, much less give one to someone else. You haven't fasted a meal. You haven't prayed an hour at one time. You haven't done anything for the Lord Jesus Christ. You make fun of the world and their habits and their sins. You scoff at them at their silly fashions. You disdain them in their filthy lifestyle. You shun them and walk to the different side of the mall. You get up and move to a different table in the restaurant because you're just loitering. But we don't enter into the gate of discipline to loiter. We enter into labor. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, that God would help us to recognize this is the work of the Lord and it is a disciplined work. Some preachers don't succeed because they're too lazy to prepare a sermon. Some Sunday school teachers never win a, a, a student to Christ because they're too lazy to prepare a lesson. 
Amen. Some churches never grow because they're too lazy to visit and pray and care. But this is a discipline work, ladies and gentlemen. We have entered into the gate of discipline. We're not playing games in this matter. He said, enter ye in at the straight gate, the discipline gate. Somebody says you disappoint me tonight, Brother Keaton. I wanted you to kind of lift us up in the clouds and let us fly around a little bit and feel real good. I'll tell you how to get up in the clouds. It's get busy for the Lord Jesus Christ and get your life disciplined according to the precepts of the Word of God and begin to live by this new economy of Christian demeanor. It's a walk of discipline. You're drawn to this gate. Oh, the work of discipline. Ecclesiastes 9 and 10, Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. For there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave, whither thou goest. The Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit draws you to the gate of discipline. And someone must have to decide if you will enter or not. But now it tells us about yet a second gate. We will call this one the gate of destruction. For it says, for wide is the gate that leadeth to destruction. Not only a gate of discipline, but a gate of destruction. And they are the only two options. Amen. They are the only two options. Either a life of Christian discipline or a life that leads to eternal destruction. There is no middle ground. There is no bargain, no blue light specials on it. Ladies and gentlemen, you are called to enter one or the other. The Spirit of the Lord called you to the gate of discipline. The Spirit of this world will call you to the gate of destruction. Let us notice some things you might encounter if you enter the gate of destruction. Number one, please note it is the destruction of the flesh. I read in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 8, For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. We live in a day when social diseases are, are rampant. We live in a day of AIDS. We live in a day when people are dying because they have sown to the flesh and because they have entered into the gate of destruction. I must tell you, it's so. Some time ago in a camp meeting, I, I came from my room one evening to go to the tabernacle for the service. A young married man stood there waiting for me. When I came out, uh, he approached me and said, could we talk just a moment? We had a couple of moments and we talked. He and his wife and two children had been a regular at that camp meeting. And he said, I must tell you, he said, I, I've only been saved a couple of weeks. He said, and I have a real problem. He said, before I was saved, he said, I left my wife and children behind. And I went down to Florida to visit some friends and have myself a little fun. The, the short of the story is uh, that while he was there, he misbehaved. He says, and now since I've come home, I've learned that I well might have contracted a disease. He said, I've told my wife about it. He said, together we've gone to the doctors. He said, and the doctors have told us. He said, we'll run tests said, but it will be four months before we can tell you for sure whether you have or have not contracted the disease. He said, and in the meantime, I can't as much as kiss my wife. And he broke down and wept, and my heart broke for him too. But then I remembered a verse in the Bible that says, he that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. Let me tell you something, young person. If you never hear it another place, I want you to hear it tonight. The world is telling you that it's the end thing to be permissive. The world is telling you that it's all right and you're right involved to kind of be knowledgeable about all things of life. I want to tell you there's some things that you'd better hold off on and you'd better keep your life pure and you'd better protect your virtue. For he that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. We live in the day of the flesh. Flesh is advertised. Immorality is made popular, even convenient. But the Bible is still true. 
he that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. And if you enter into the gate of destruction, you will somewhere along the line sow to the flesh. But wait a minute. Not only is entering the gate of the destruction, is it the destruction of the flesh, but it's also the destruction of the family. I note with interest that in our recent elections, regardless of what their ulterior motive might have been, the politicians could no longer ignore the deprived condition of the family in America. They can no longer ignore it. And if you enter into that gate of destruction and reject the gate of discipline, and you do not choose to live the life of the Christian economy, and you choose to go your own way, your family has just become a high-risk family. I don't say it because I wish it upon you, because I don't. I don't say it because I think it's good enough for you, because I don't. But I'm telling you, the fact of the matter is, if you choose the gate of destruction, your family has just become high risk. Exodus chapter 10. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children under the third and the fourth generation of them that hate me. I read a passage of Scripture some time ago and I got real blessed over it. Nobody else seemed to get blessed. They didn't seem to see anything so pretty in it. But I still think it's beautiful. Just listen to this. Enoch, the seventh from Adam. You didn't get blessed either. Let me tell you why that blesses me. Because there happened to have been another Enoch. Enoch, the fourth from Adam. Enoch the fourth from Adam was the descendant of, of Cain. And like his father, he was a violent man and a vile man. And he died a violent death. And then the Bible says, and there was Enoch the seventh from Adam, who was the descendant of Seth. And who, like unto his father, walked with God. And he walked so close with God that one day on their walk together, he walked past heaven's gate. And the Lord said, come in and spend the day. And night has never come, and so he's still there. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Enoch the servant from Adam. Oh, you can be blessed because like his fathers, he walked with God. But I'm here to tell you, if you do not choose the gate of discipline, but rather the gate of destruction, it is the destruction of the family. The Victory Trio will know instantly of whom I speak. The Victory Trio, another preacher and myself, labored together in a good old-fashioned holiness camp meeting. My, other, my co-worker at preaching was an interesting man and uh, did his best to carry his load of that camp meeting. We had many a good long talk, and he had some prospects. He, there was a lot of hope for him. He preached well. He had results at the altar. Folks sought the Lord under his ministry. But just not long ago, just a few weeks ago, I'd known it for some time that he'd given up preaching and gone into business. He and his wife were now separated. I stopped by his place of business and I prayed before I got there and the Lord answered my prayer. When I arrived, there was nobody there but him. He didn't have a customer in the place. And I walked in and had a nice long visit with him and asked him, said, look, is there anything I can do to help? I really care about your family. I really care about your ministry. I really care about you. I took liberty to put an arm around his shoulder and say, I... I'd really like to see you get back to God and get, get it back together. And he looked at me and he said, it's a hopeless thing now. I said, maybe not. Let's talk about it. He said, it's hopeless. It's all over. He said, it's over. He said, I've made the wrong choices. I've made the wrong choices. Since then, I got a letter from his wife and she said, please pray for him. Our divorce was final. And she mentioned the date that the divorce was final. 
And here is a young man who had prospects in the ministry, who preached revivals and camp meetings and pastored churches and had two little children who were now in their early teens and had a wife that loved him and was faithful to him. And here he is. He decided to go through the other gate. He decided the gate of discipline was too strict and it was too straight. And so he chose the gate of destruction, holding faith in a good conscience when some, having put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck. In this beautiful congregation tonight, there's a number of people who have spent a number of years around Bible college campuses, holiness Bible college campuses, and they can vouch for what I'm going to tell you. It seems to me that I've ministered on every campus of every holiness Bible school that we have in America, and I count it a privilege. But we all could tell the same sad stories. Our PR men don't tell it, and nor should they but I will. Somewhere in the vicinity of all of our campuses, their little homes or what's left of them, little families or what's left of them. They came one time to a Bible school. They entered our campuses, looked like they had wallowed in talent. They had ability, they had promise. They had it all. They could sing. They could preach. They could draw. They could teach. They could do all these things. And surely they were going to be great workers in the kingdom of God. But they began making the wrong choices. Decided they did not want the life of discipline. The discipline of the Christ life. Decided they did not want the discipline that was required to live clean and godly and holy and economical. They did not want that way. And so they turned and entered the gate of destruction. Some of them now, you go in the little home, three or four little children, sometimes each of them looking like a different daddy. I talked to one of them not long ago, and I approached him and I said, tell me, sir, tell me, is there anything I can do to help you get back to God? And he said to me, he said, I'm not even sure there is a God anymore. What had he done? He had entered the gate of destruction and that it was the destruction of his faith. Your faith is the most valuable thing you have tonight. You could lose about everything else. I hope you don't lose your health. Oh, I pray you don't. But if you did, if you did, it wouldn't cost you your soul. I pray you don't lose your family members in death. I pray that doesn't happen. But if it did, somehow God's grace could keep you and somehow you could make it. I pray you don't lose your money. I hope that you're able to make it and things go well for you and you prosper. I really hope you do. But I want to tell you something. If you lost it all, it wouldn't have to cost you your soul. But if you lose your faith, if you lose your faith, you're forever hopeless without faith for without faith it is impossible to please God and you keep going the way you're going oh you might still believe there's a Jesus and you might still think the Bible's a pretty good book but the things that really count your faith the very structure superstructure of your faith will begin to crumble somewhere and the devil will get you to lose faith in your people in this crowd And then he'll lead you to another crowd and then he'll get you to lose faith in them. And he'll keep on until you have no faith. All because, not because somebody wronged you, not because somebody else failed, not because someone you knew went bad, no, 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 but because you and you must accept the responsibility for it. You chose to enter into the gate of destruction. Which gate would you enter? Which gate? Which gate would you enter? For it is the destruction of your faith. I shall never forget that young family that began attending my church. They slipped in after the singing would begin. And they slipped out before I had time to get back to shake hands. It happened week in and week out. I found where they lived and I paid them a visit, but they had nothing to say. And I I talked a little and prayed a little and went home. You couldn't break the shell. You couldn't get through. You couldn't get their attention. You couldn't get acquainted. 
But they kept coming. And they kept coming. I'll never forget that Sunday night. A number of people lined the altar to pray. And I looked and here, here that couple came. Their little children stayed in the seats. And here they came holding hands, walking down the aisle. And they knelt at the altar. We prayed with folks at the altar, finally made our way to them. And finally, with their arms locked at the altar, they looked up at me and hot tears ran down their face. And they called me pastor. And they said, pastor, we have lost our faith. And they told me they were both preacher's children. And they said, but we made the wrong choices and thought we would just go out a little ways and have a little fun. He said, but it's cost us our faith. And now we can't come to grips with God because we don't have the faith anymore. I wished I could have given them a quick answer. I wished I could have said, well, here's the verse. You read this and it'll restart it. I wish I could have said one little cliche and it taken care of it, but it wasn't that way. I worked for weeks. I worked for months, possibly a year, before their faith again began to take hold. Thank God it did eventually, but they were almost lost. They almost lost. They almost didn't take the courage to step out and try again because they had made the wrong choice and it had cost them their faith. Your faith is the most valuable thing you have in all the world. The most valuable thing you have. I must ask you tonight, what will you do? What will you do about the commandment of God that says, enter ye in at the straight gate? Enter ye in at the discipline gate. Will you follow the life of Christ? Will you order your life by the discipline of Christian living in every way? Will you make that choice? If you will not, you would probably be wasting your time to make a public show at this altar tonight. But if your will has settled it, that you are willing to enter into the life of discipline, the disciplined life of prayer, the disciplined life of obedience, the disciplined life of walking in a godly way and forsaking this old world and leaving it behind. If you would come to that point in time, if you would make that kind of a choice, you could enter into the straight gate. Now, the message would not be complete without giving you the end results. The Bible tells us. If you enter into the gate of destruction, the Bible said it's the way unto death. I didn't write it. I just found it and I'm sharing it with you. It's the way unto death. But if you will enter into the life of discipline, it is the way unto eternal life. Hallelujah. The choice is yours. Which would it be? A man was concerned about his soul. And he went to a preacher and he said, Preacher, tell me. Be honest with me, preacher. Tell me, when must I get saved? And the preacher said, You don't have to get saved until just before you die. The man felt a bit of relief and turned to walk away and then had a second thought and wheeled back to the preacher and said, But preacher, tell me. When will that be? And the wise preacher said, that's the very point I wanted to make. I don't have any idea. It may be today. Therefore, today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let me ask you tonight in all simplicity but with all sincerity, which gate will you enter? Stand with me, please, and bow your heads. The music will begin, but if there is a soul here anywhere that would choose to become a Christian, that would choose to follow Jesus Christ from this camp meeting on, would you step out quickly? Would you step out quickly? Come to an altar of prayer.